There we are. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Raj Delari from Zintegra. I wanted to welcome you to our webinar, part of our uh, tech series that uh, we're, we've been running uh, actually for a while now. Uh, today's uh, The topic of today's webinar is simplifying NetScaler management with Citrix ADM, or Application Delivery Manager. And uh, I'm really pleased to say that I'm joined by a number of folks from Cloud Software Group and Citrix, starting with Jeremy Myers, who's a senior manager of pre-sales at Citrix. So Jeremy, welcome. We're also joined by Rich Mancuso, who is a NetScaler sales engineer for the partners. Uh, so he spends a lot of time dealing with NetScalers and dealing with partners, and we're very fortunate to work along with him. And then finally, certainly not last, Justin Weldon, who is from Zentegra and is one of our NetScaler architects. And he will be working along with uh, Rich uh, with the presentation and demo and offering perspectives as we move along. So uh, once again, welcome. Uh, this webinar is going to last about 60 minutes. The, the way that we have uh, put this together is uh, we're going to start off, let's spend probably about 20 minutes talking about the technology, talking about ADM. And talking about it, and I'm going to go into this in just a second, about how it's, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best kept secrets at Citrix. Um, ADM effectively is free. Um, and being free uh, is a great thing. But more than that, it offers a ton of functionality that uh, you wouldn't expect. Um, what we've found is when customers are using ADM, they're able to reduce the amount of effort that they spend managing their net scalers by as much as 50%. So that's not too bad for a free tool. Now, Citrix has also taken it a step further to say, look, uh, if you're more serious and you want to expand it to more uh, devices, there actually is a paid service. But let me be clear, paid service is not very expensive. It starts at about $1,000 a year. Um, and uh, really when it comes down to it, when you start looking at the benefit uh, that this provides, uh, it really is great value. So, um, with that, um, or sorry, actually, I didn't really finish my thought. Mm. We are going to be spending the first part of the uh, of the webinar talking about the technology. Then we're going to move on to a demo, and uh, the demo is going to be run by by Rich and Justin. And then we're going to do a QA towards the end. And and, and with the QA, uh, really, we we allocated about 15, 20 minutes to it. We might shrink that down a bit based on how things go, or we might expand it. We'll see how it goes. But uh, more than that, I wanted to welcome everyone uh, to the webinar. Uh, we're really excited to have you here, and we're also really excited to talk about uh, ADM, just largely because, yeah, we believe it's, uh, you know, it's a really good secret that C Citrix seems to keep to themselves. Actually, they don't. They've, they've done a good job of getting the message out. But uh, we really think it provides extraordinary value, and uh, I think you'll find this uh, webinar very useful. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Jeremy. Jeremy, uh, I think you were going to take us through a, a little bit of a discussion of, uh, of the technology. So over to you. Excellent. Excellent. So can you hear me okay, Raj? I can hear you perfectly. Perfect. Um, so thanks for covering the agenda. So um, you know, the goal here today is we want to talk about ADM. Um, we're going to go into, well, heck, we can only go so far with ADM. ADM actually is a pretty powerful platform. Um, the best part is, I mean, listen, if you own a NetScaler, you should be using it because you can get it for free. Um, now, obviously, there are some paid things, and we'll cover what that looks like. But you know, I think for you know for what you usually get for free, I mean, holy smokes, you get a lot wrapped up into the free tier of ADM um, to the point to where if you have NetScalers anywhere in your environment, um, this is what you want to use to leverage it. So we'll talk through that. Um, you know, having said all that, you know, we're going to cover two or three, maybe four use cases that are easy ones to get started with, um, some things that you'll you'll get right out of the box. And then we'll touch on uh, some things that you can do on down the line just to ease deployments and you know, just simplify um, you know, what you can do with NetScaler. Um, and more importantly, we're gonna get some, to some demos. So you know, from a demo perspective, we're gonna touch those two or three use cases, um, you know, stop and pause and press the button so we can kind of see what they do. Uh, but just understand that the platform is super extensible, um, does a lot of things, so ask away. Um, and then lastly, we've got a Q&A box. So listen, don't hesitate to drop a question in the Q&A. You know, as we go through this, the four of us will be monitoring the queue um, and we'll pause and, you know, toss the question up to Rich or Justin or myself, just depending on you know who's out there. But more than anything, um, you know, I am just, just to give you some background, I'm primarily a virtualization guy. 
So going through NetScale or going through ADM was an eye opener for me as a part of this process. So I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, but listen, it all starts with the platform. So interestingly enough, you know, Citrix ADM um, is what we'll call it, Application Delivery Manager, uh, is a platform for managing a fleet of NetScalers. Not just managing the fleet, so it's easy to look across your entire fleet across all the different locations that they're hosted. So, you know, for a lot of us, you know, we have might have a pair of data centers. Um, there might be hardware. Listen, ADM has insight into them, manage configurations, manage uh, versions of code, uh, can upgrade, downgrade, you know, things like that. But um, also in the cloud as well. So if you've got NetScalers sitting in any of the hyperscalers like AWS or um, or Azure GCP, you've got a single point to manage across that entire fleet. Uh, and with that, you know, if you're a pooled capacity customer today, you got to use ADM. That is how you're managing your licensing across your entire fleet of NetScalers. Um, so you don't know what pooled licensing is, um, as opposed to putting licensing on each NetScaler. You basically have a pool of licensing that sits centrally on ADM, and you can divvy up that licensing across your entire fleet as you see fit. So that is one piece to this. Um, second, you know, what do you do with NetScaler? Well, you're delivering applications, you're delivering web apps, you're delivering all sorts of things. Um, but it's nice to have insight into what those applications are doing across all of the locations as well. So you know, that's the other thing we'll pop into as well is how well are these applications performing? You know, I'm securing these things with, you know, an SSL certificate. What's the health of those certs? And as you get further and further and deeper into the platform, you understand that there's a lot we can do from a security perspective as well. Too much to do on a webinar like today, but just know it goes pretty deep. Um, and next, you know, knowing that it's pretty common to have applications distributed across different locations, um, you can push out uniform configurations across all of them, right? So you create the configuration once, you push that out to data center one, and you can easily push it out to data center two. Let's just say you don't even know how to configure a particular app. Well, you know, we've got cookbooks, if you will, that you can push out, you enter some information in and push these configs out to all the net scalers, um, you know, at the same time. And then lastly, just to speed up troubleshooting, um, the idea that it's easy to, easy to hone in on um, what might be wrong uh, with an application and get some insight, whether it's performance, whether it's backend servers are down, Again, just having sort of a bird's eye view across the applications running everywhere um, is what ADM is really, really good at. So here's the tease. There is a free tier to ADM, but as it turns out, it's pretty powerful. And so, you know, for the most part, you can bring in your entire fleet of NetScalers. You can manage things like configurations, backups, firmware loads, things like from a central spot. You can manage all the licensing from a central spot, you know, where it really adds value is when you get into the applications itself. So it comes with two VIPs. So just to give you an idea, if you got a gateway front-ending NetScale, I mean, front-ending your CBAT environment, that's a VIP. If you've got an application that's distributed between two different locations, VIP, VIP in one later, uh, location, VIP in another, that's two VIPs. So each of the load balance VIPs you have on the NetScalers, that is a VIP that we're pulling into ADM and monitoring. Um, where does the service get paid? Well, is you want to do things like analytics, where you want to, you know, over time understand the performance of, you know, your your environment, where you want to be able to dive in uh, and get, you know, security insights into what's going on. You know, that's where we use get into the paid service. But if you just want to manage a fleet of net scalers, get familiar with it with a couple of VIPs to turn on analytics. Listen, you can do it all day long. In fact, as soon as this webinar is over, you can go to the Citrix Cloud website sign up for an account and have ADM within an hour, just so you know. So, so Raj hit on this just a little bit. Um, you know, how do you, how do you license it? Well, like I just mentioned, it's all licensed based on the number of virtual servers, the number of VIPs that you have on your net scalers that you want to bring in and monitor. Um, you know, out of the gate, uh, it, it's 10, uh, basically 10 VIPs is what you, what you start with. So you can start with a starter pack that's 10 VIPs. Um, you can add on one at a time if you need to. Um, of course, we can do multi-year subscriptions if you need to. Um, the other thing that's pretty important to understand is uh, ADM runs potentially in two different locations. So there is an on-prem version of ADM that you can run, and there's also the service. Uh, when you purchase ADM VIPs, it gives you the option of running in either location. So depending on what 
you know, your cloud posture is, depending on what your requirements are, you can run on one or the other. Now, the feature set is not exactly the same, um, and we'll go into that later in the in the uh, in the webinar here. But ultimately, just know, depending on how, what you choose to do, you can run it in either location. Um, and then additionally, specifically to the ADM service, um, you get five gigs per VIP, I want to say, um, of storage for things like analytics and just storage and things like that. You can always add on more if you need to. Uh, but ultimately, just to get your foot in the door, in addition to the two VIPs that come on the free tier altogether, for about 100 bucks um, per VIP for three years, that's, that's literally 1000 bucks a year just to turn on ADM and get started with 12 VIPs uh, in your environment. Now, like I said, there is an on-prem version and there is a service version. Um, the differences uh, are pretty powerful. Number one, you know, if you were running ADM on-prem, it's, it's you know, recommended practice to, to run those in an HA pair, right? You don't want to have one, you know, ADM server. If that goes down, obviously you want to have a backup. Um, that's not something you have to worry about. Um, as a service, Citrix manages that. You know, we keep it updated. There are versions to ADM on-prem. Obviously, that's not something you need to manage or, or care about in the cloud. Um, like I mentioned, it's easy to go log into the Citrus Cloud website, you know, log in, create an account, onboard yourself, and literally within an hour, you could have ADM service. So super, super quick to stand up. Um, and with an agent running in some of the locations where you have net scalers, it's really easy to onboard your, your ADCs uh, and get those into the ADM service. Um, in addition to that, you know, we've got the algorithm that we're running in the cloud, the machine learning algorithm. So we can do the things like the analytics. You know, we can add on, um, you know, the CVE database so that we know which CVEs, if there's a security, you know, issue that might be impacting one of the platforms, we'll call that out and put that front and center. You know, that's something you get with the service that you don't get on-prem. Um, it's less to manage. So it's less OPEX. You know, the service is something that comes with the VIP. It, there's a free tier to it. There's not something you have to manage. No VMs you have to stand up. Just less, less time and, and resources. Um, the service supports running um, or pulling in ADCs across any of your locations. So whether it's on-prem, whether it's in a public cloud, you know, because it is the service, we can tie into your ADC fleet that might be running across locations. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we can tie into any application. So you know, as you start considering if you're an organization looking at DevOps, looking at um, any sort of microservices, now we can manage things like the CPX version of NetScale, or we can look at individual services and pull those in and give you sort of a, uh, a better view into, you know, distributed applications. So I'm going to hand this over to Rich, and we're going to go into four specific use cases that we'll talk about here, but then later we'll go into a little bit deeper um, you know, in our demo. And it all starts with the upgrade advisory. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, the, uh, the advisors we're going to talk about too, the upgrade advisory and security advisory, these are a set of features we introduced, I want to say just about a year now that, uh, you know, a lot of the customers I've spoken to, they've been very interested in it. It's received a lot of traction because it's, you know, something simple, but very, you know, very powerful. And, you know, in the first case here, as you can see, it'll just tell you for any of your ADC firmware, you know, what is reaching end of maintenance, you know, what is reaching end of life. Like right now, we're coming up toward the end of life of 12.1. So we have a lot of customers that are, you know, identifying those in their environment and then making the plans uh, to do the upgrade. And, you know, in the old way, right, you'd have to keep track of it or you'd have to go connect to each of your appliances and double check hey, what, what firmware are they all running. And then you would have to run through the manual, you know, upgrade uh, procedure. And then especially uh, for those of you that are familiar and working with our, like our HA pairs, you know, the specific steps that have to be followed, you know, to upgrade the secondary, then the primary and so on. It's, you know, it's a process. Uh, that has to be done, but with our ADM and uh, you know specifically these advisory advisories, but also our upgrade workflows, all of that can be completely scheduled and automated uh, for you. And we'll we'll show you what that looks like uh, in the demo. 
if you can click on yeah. So the other piece of it, so in terms of not just about end of life and end of maintenance builds, right? We typically release updates, I'd say usually on a quarterly basis, barring you know some emergent, you know, a CVE update. So again, you know, to keep track of that, if you only have a couple appliances, you know, you can kind of keep track of that manually or in a spreadsheet. But then, you know, the larger your fleet is, the more time consuming that is to do. So one of the things our upgrade could advisory will quickly show you what spread of builds do you have, you know, across your environment? Are you one back, two back, three back from the latest? releases so this way you can know you know where you stand and again plan upgrades you know accordingly so rich one thing mm -hmm. that i didn't realize and one of the biggest challenges that i've had in the past is when i go to download the latest build i mean there are still several different versions available they're all supported so how do i know which one would be recommended? So that that's a question that I've gotten in the past from customers, and it's just the, honestly the same thing I get when I'm trying to upgrade net scalers. In our instances, which one should I be using? I think that's one of the pieces that's included as well as a recommendation. You know, what what should I be using? Yeah, and you know, one of the I think I don't forget it's the next one or the one after that when you build it out here, it, you you can set a preferred. There it is, right on the next one. Is. You can set your preferred build as well. So if you say we're standardizing on the build that came out in Q1, right? If that, it could immediately tell you if you have any uh, net scalers that are not at that build. Right. You know, typically uh, with any firmware, you know, there's always questions of do you always go to the most current release or one back or two back for, you know, stability reasons. Um, the way we're doing releases now, you know, there's always, you know, bug fixes that are coming out. And in the case of current builds like 13.1, there may be new features, you know, released as well with each of those quarterly uh, releases. So it's... Sleep, David. Um, Sleep. 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 Yeah, Moen. So, and let's see, the... Um, and the last piece we, we kind of touched on already, so not only can you identify these outliers or needs for upgrades, but like I said, the ADM can then do that upgrade workflow for you, whether it's a single appliance, HA pair, a fleet of appliances, you can schedule those upgrades for your downtime windows. It'll go ahead and perform the upgrades and this way then you're all set instead of having to sit there, run through those manual steps that I'm sure many of you are used to. And like I said, then the demo will show you a little bit what this uh, looks like. I'm just sorry, Rich, and that, cut in there, but just just yeah, further to Jeremy's ahead. question about which build, you know, I, I typically go with the latest maintenance release. Uh, when you look on the downloads website, there's the features release and the down and the maintenance release, and features typically means that they're still adding new features to it. So while they uh, hopefully don't break existing features, there's always that possibility. So I usually tell my customers the latest maintenance release. Yep, good idea. Thank you, Justin. Um, so going hand in hand with the upgrade advisory is our security advisory. And, um, you know, it's an important piece because, you know, it's addressing vulnerabilities in the appliance, right? Ideally, we wouldn't want to have any vulnerabilities, but as you can, we're not alone in the industry, right? Every vendor, you know, is dealing with, you know, the hacker community or the security community trying to find all different ways to break, you know, break the software. So, and just like us and everybody else, you know, we find or they find issues that need to be remediated you know some of those issues are minor some of those issues can be severe and right we always uh when we make our announcements we make our cve announcements and then you know post whatever remediation steps are required sometimes that's a firmware upgrade sometimes it's a configuration change sometimes it's both so again it's something that people you know as administrators you'd have to you know manually 
keep track of, you know, do you know when the CV comes out and you got to see what versions are affected, then you got to compare that to the versions you have. So what our security advisory service will do is kind of do all of that for, for you. So on a weekly basis, it'll keep track of whatever firmware you're running across the environment and then compare that to any of the open CVEs that we've published. So it's basically includes CVEs since the service started. So that's a little over a year. So pretty much, uh, you know, at this point, I could say any current CVE for a net scaler is in, in the service. So uh, when it scans your environment, it'll be able to tell you, you know, which appliances are affected by CVEs, give you that list of CVEs so you can say, is this something that I need to worry about or not, right? It'll show you the severity level for those, you know, and what the impact uh, could be. And then, you know, just like the upgrade advisory, if it's a firmware upgrade that's required, you can schedule a firmware upgrade. And then if there's configuration changes that need to be made using our configuration job technology and ADM, it can push out those commands as well. So it allows you to schedule that activity from your time window. To, and also helps eliminate human error, right? Especially anytime you have to do any CLI commands or changes that we recommend for these, you know, the, uh, the uh, configuration job will just do that automatically uh, uh, for you. So, so quick question about this, Rich. I know we got one more bullet to hit here, mm -hmm. but is the security advisory, is it available? Is available with the on-prem ADM as well as the cloud service or just the cloud service? So both the security advisory, upgrade advisory started uh, cloud or ADM service only. Um, right now we're previewing some of the features in on-prem, I would gotcha. call it a subset or a limited set of of okay. the features in on-prem, we'll see how far we take it on the on-prem. But yeah, things like this, you know, going forward, we'll probably always start in the service first. And then the question is, you know, how much of it or if at all does it make it into the on-prem version? And, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, and we'll talk about it more later, at this point, I, I kind of look at the on-prem version as a subset of the service. And, you know, and we'll point out some of the differences in a little bit. But uh, so, you know, right now, I would say for the full functionality of the advisories, it requires the service. And I guess on some level, it probably makes sense when you think about it, you know, from uh, any of the analytics, you know, there's an engine that runs in the cloud, not on-prem. And then secondly, um, just the database of CVEs and the tie-in, probably it's easier to tie into the cloud as it would be on-prem. Uh, I'm going to send you a link. Right. Yeah. Because what the good thing is, we don't have to, you know, we can put that information in the cloud. If you're doing it on prem, then yeah. you have to make sure your on prem information is up to date. Otherwise, you're going to get mis, you know, you might have misinformed information, right? If your database didn't update properly or for whatever reason, you think you're okay and you're really not. So that that's, you know, some of the reasons, uh, again, leading it to service only. The next piece we're going to touch on a use case is just SSL management. And then, you know, specifically as this, these slides talk about, you know, A plus rating, but we're going to show in the demo both pieces, you know, one of the things, especially with the net scaler, if it's fronting most of your external access, whether it's gateway or, you know, other websites that you're exposing, you know, whether internally or externally, Right, keeping track of SSL certificates, you know, is work. Again, it's something you have to, you know, keep track of because the worst thing you want to do is wake up one morning and all of a sudden there's a queue of support tickets saying I can't get into this site and I'm getting an SSL error message. Right, <laughs> that's I'm sure that's happened to everybody on this call at one time or another. So what ADM can do is keep track of all your certs across the fleet of net scalers and immediately tell you who's coming up for expiring, which ones have already expired, if that's already happened, 
But like I said, more importantly, you know, say which ones are coming up in the next 30, 60, 90 days so you can plan uh, to renew or refresh those certificates. The other piece, um, and this is kind of more become more important lately, you know, especially again with vulnerabilities and um, you know, with breaches into company data is to ensure your SSL configuration right meets an A plus rating from SSL lab. So that means you, you know, you have the proper suites, ciphers, and things that are that are still considered secure and not easily broken, right? And so you're you're not using things like TLS 1.0, right? You're not using weak ciphers mm -hmm. and so on. So, so Rich, so this, is, this, is, this is something I am guilty of, I'll fully admit, because I've deployed several VPX, v, VPXs across the years for Gateway, but I just assumed the default configuration was a good configuration, and you didn't tell me until recently that if you leave all the defaults and just import your shirt and run it, you'll probably get a C rating as opposed to an A+, plus, which is what we're looking for. Yeah, exactly. And so, and that's a huge thing, you know, if, if customers don't, you know, take care of this during their deployments, you know, they're not going to be as secure as they could be. And then even if, you know, for customers that are, you know, usually methodical about doing that, you know, there's always the case of human error and maybe somebody missed something, right? They missed a checkbox or right? a simple thing of mixing, missing a checkbox and having TLS 1.0 enabled, you know, could lead to, you know, potential breach of uh, of that application or data. So, you know, typically, again, the organizations might have external scans of these infrastructures that I catch that, but those may be run once a year or once a quarter, where with ADM, it's always checking the environment. So it can tell you, like I said, when certificates are expiring, but it also can tell you how many, you know, um, you know, V servers you have that are not meeting the A plus rating. And then not only that, it can also remedi remediate it for you. So if you want that A plus rating, you click on that V server and you can say, okay, go ahead and make the changes to make it A plus and it'll run the commands on the appropriate net scaler. So you have that rating. So, you know, very powerful, very simple. Now, the next thing I would so the the first kind of areas that we went into here, I call them very, you know, simple to use functions that provide a lot of value. This last thing we wanted to touch on is our style book functionality. Now, this I would call kind of more advanced use cases from ADM, but very, you know, very powerful. And what style books let you do is deploy a configuration without having to go through all the manual steps that are involved in that configuration on a net scaler. So what does that mean? So in the case you're publishing, you know, a simple, even just a load balanced virtual server, right? You have to create your servers, you have to create your services, maybe service groups, and then you finally create the, the V server. Maybe you're, you're also doing a content switch with it, right? It has a, specific set of steps that all have to be done to do that. What style books do is abstract all those steps, you know, whether it's from the administrator or maybe you use this to delegate the steps. So maybe you're going to allow developers to publish, you know, a site and they don't have to know anything about how the Netscaler works. So what the, style book lets you do is just enter in the key information. What are my backend servers? What are the ports say that are involved? What is the certificate for it? And then you could also have certain options for optional settings that you may want. But what the style book can then do with that information is execute all the commands for that configuration, right? So it'll go through all that process you know, for you, so you don't you don't have to remember. Okay, wait, what do I have to do to do a GSLB, or what do I have to do to just do a content switch and load balancer? So in essence, so you it, could have a style book, a cookbook, if you will, that would say, "Hey, I've got an application. It's sitting in two different separate data centers. I want to globally load balance. 
as part of the, the import of the style book, it'll ask you some basic questions, maybe where, where are the hosts, where are the servers, and then actually set up both the load balance VIPs as well as GSLB. Exactly. Really, yeah. Yeah. Uh, make, yeah. Again, it, it, you know, it simplifies that deployment. Some of the other things it does with that deployment, you know, especially the longer net scalers have been around in an organization, it also standardizes things like the naming. What do you name your services? What do you name the V servers and so on? You know, especially you know, I see it more often than not, you know, depending on what admins change, all of a sudden the naming standards change inside a net scaler. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, you know, the new people want to call it this, the old people call it something else. And now if then another person comes in and now there's two different standards and they're going to bring in a third standard. So style books help you standardize that information for your environment going forward. So we'll touch on that briefly in the demo. Like I said, that's more of an advanced use case, but a very, very powerful one. So, so I think it's um, yeah, yeah. So while Rich is, uh, so we're, we're going to kick off the demo here in a second. So while he's teeing that up, um, the last thing I wanted to hit on was along the lines of Nicholas's question is just some of the differences between the service and on-prem. You, know, you can kind of put them in four different buckets. You know, the first one is just anything related to, you know, the analytics, machine learning analytics. So usage analytics, root cause type stuff, um, you know, that's going to require some services that we only have running in the cloud to process. Um, and make that visible too. Um, you know, secondly, is just any of the statistical model-based stuff. So, you know, anything around the app. So what Rich just walked through around the SSL app ratings, you know, that is, that's only something that sits in the cloud. Um, we can, even though you do get visibility in all your search on-prem, you know, we also have an integration, um, you know, with Benefi around just being able to, you know, issue and renew search as well. So that's, again, something that only sits in the cloud. You know, any of our app security pieces, so WAF, you know, any of the recommendations, API gateway stuff, you know, that would only be service related. And then lastly, and I think we touched on that just a little bit, is the upgrade security advisory stuff, you know, that only sits in the cloud. But, you know, being able to upgrade, you know, and automate and, you know, do some of the configuration stuff, that all sits on-prem as well. It's just the advisory services are the pieces that uh, would sit in the cloud. Just to keep them updated is really what it is. All right. So let's All get into right. it a little bit, Rich. So I'm going okay. to pass it over to you here. Yeah, let me go ahead and share out the demo. Okay. Oh, well, sorry. I that left that up. I, I didn't want to go through the login process so, uh, since uh, we have a little different way to get into it for our demo environments, but. So this is our ADM service uh, demo environment we have for it. And, um, you know, one of the things too, like this dashboard is one of the features that's service specific. But one of the nice things about when you come right in here into the ADM service after onboarding your appliances, right out of the gate, you'll be able to see the health of your applications, you know, your infrastructure and gateway. So we'll touch on all of these pretty quick and kind of point out some of the stuff that we talked about in the presentation. So you can see here right out of the gate, right? I mentioned the, the SSL rating. So you, right on this dashboard, you'll know how many applications or V servers that you have that don't, you know, that are not currently meeting the SSL rating. And I said that also you can then see, you know, uh, expirations uh, for SSL certs. I don't know, they must've changed something. I don't know why they have, we have 2000 expiring and greater than 90 days. Uh, they must've been changing something in the environment, but you can see here we it's had new certs, yeah. Yeah, something that's changed just today from yesterday. Um, yeah, we have 18 that have already expired, which probably, hopefully they weren't being used, but if they were, right, we would need to take a look at that and, and address that. And then, like I said, more, you know, more importantly, right, what's expiring upcoming, right? Do we have any certs that are expiring in the next, uh, you know, 30 to 90 days that we can start being proactive or, you know, marking time on our schedule uh, to deal with that? 
And then up on the top here is, you know, Jeremy just mentioned some of the, you know, machine learning pieces. You know, that's where you would see some of that from the application health, right? If we detecting anything with anomalies, right? So like response time anomalies. So that's part of the machine learning, right? It's, we're keeping track of the normal response time. You know, for an application is all of a sudden something different, right? If it normally responds in, you know, five milliseconds and now all of a sudden it's taking 30 milliseconds to respond, that's something an administrator should know. And that would be the example of something you would see here on the dashboard, as well as then being able to drill down into the separate applications. The next piece, you know, showing our infrastructure health, right? You know, all for all the appliance instances out there, what type of issues are we seeing so here again, SSL config issues, maybe some system resource issues, config deviation, right? We check save versus running. It's happened to everybody, I'm sure, where you know you've made some changes, wanted to see how it goes before saving it, and then you forget to save it. Then all of a sudden you reboot and wonder why things don't work anymore. You know, so things like that, you know, ADM can help and point that out to you. Hey, you got six instances where the configs don't match. Is is that right or not uh, for the current state? And then in terms of the advisories, we'll drill down into them in more detail. But here on the dashboard, you can quickly see, hey, do I have any older builds in my fleet? And then more importantly, from the security advisory, how many instances or appliances do, do I have that are impacted you know, by CVEs? So in this case, I got four, and we'll, we'll drill into that you know, in a, in a few minutes. And the last piece, you know, one of the most common use cases for the NetScaler is a gateway, right, for the virtualization environment. So ICA proxy, so because that's such a, you know, key use case, right, it's, you know, we show that here on the dashboard. You can see how many uh, active connections and users you have. And again, what type of things might be affecting user experience, right? Typical things, you know, if there's high ICA round trip times or high data center latency, you want to be able to know that, or in this case, access errors. So if we're getting a whole bunch of login failures, right? You know, is somebody trying to hack in, you know, trying to do a brute force attack into our environment. So you have this information at a quick glance. And then, you know, even more importantly, where are these connections coming from? And we could set time ranges as well. Right now, the dashboard here defaults just to the last hour, but you can uh, you know, change that as well to look at this over a longer period of time. But very handy, hey, you know, do you have somebody coming in from countries you don't expect? Or as we'll show later too, you can drill down even in the US and see what states they're coming from. So again, for, you know, additional information to ensure the, you know, the proper use, you know, of your, of your resources. So the, the other piece with gateway, which we'll go into first is the analytics capability. So, the, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, this is, you know, part of the paid piece for ADM, you know, and it requires those VIP licenses. But what you get is something very powerful for, for any NetScaler gateway use cases. So you can see here when I come into this screen by default, it's showing me the last hour of activity for all the users that are coming in via gateway during that hour. And what you can tell right away is, do I have any users that are having experience problems? You know, a good rule of thumb that we always say, you know, if the ICA round trip time is over 200, 250 milliseconds, the users probably are noticing something, right? They're probably, and especially in these cases here where we got users where 800 to one second, they're not enjoying their user experience at the moment, right? Now, whether they've called into the help desk or to complain, 
or just living with it, right? And then, you know, complaining to their managers or something some other times like, oh, you know, Citrix stinks, right? The performance is lousy. You know, how many times have administrators have heard that? But now with this information, uh, you can be armed to say, you know, Jeremy mentioned earlier from a proactive and troubleshooting point of view, well, where is that problem coming from? So the ICA round trip time, this is something you would get, you know, it's part of the ICA protocol that generates this as layer seven information. You would be able to see it in director or the Citrix cloud and so on. Mm -hmm. But what you don't get anywhere else but ADM is the breakdown of the layer two connectivity that makes up that connection, right? So WAN latency, that's from the client to the net scaler. DC latency is from the net scaler to the back end of EDA. So, you know, what you can see here, you know, with this, uh, with this group of users here on the top, is a, there's a data center latency. So something's going on either in the network in the data center or the odds are if there's only a handful of users, maybe they're all on a server that's having problems, right? It's overloaded. You know, maybe something is um, eating up the resources on the server, right? But now you know, you know, where to focus uh, the, the your efforts in troubleshooting. Hey, I have to take a look hey, of what's going on. And we can scroll over here. You get more information. You know, you can also see, you know, what client, you know, the user is connecting to. Again, if it was client side, right, maybe they're, you know, like in this case, <laughs> You can see we've had some of this demo environment stuff for a while, right? A, you know, a BlackBerry device, right? You know, is it some, you know, you start to see if there's any similarities across the users, right? Are they on the same server? Are they using the same device? And so on. And then you can drill down into the users themselves to see more information. But I just want to do is I'm going to blow this out to uh, one day because the the last hour didn't show uh, one of the other use cases that I wanted to pull up here. And you can see, you know, this user here is the opposite, right? There's a WAN latency problem with this user. So now that, that means there's something between that user's, you know, desktop, laptop, and the net scaler. Maybe it's their home Wi-Fi is lousy, right? Their home router. Maybe you'll they're working at a home, but all the kids are streaming Netflix or something, right? You know, something look at those, is look going at those on. Bits per second, Rich. That's that's like back in the day. When right. I was on 56K. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you, know, you can see here client side retransmit. So maybe there's a network problem, right? Causing a lot of retransmits. Now, what you can do, I'll, I can pick any of the users, I'll pick this one just to show. Now, th this is demo generated data, so it's fairly consistent. But you know, you could look at it from an hour all the way to a month. So you can see what the history was for that user. Are they norm have they always been this bad? Did something just change in the last day or two or last week, right? So you can again try to get gather more information to try to help troubleshoot, you know, the problem. And then again, here down at the bottom, you can see all the sessions that happened in that time frame. Again, like I said, this is all demo generated, so it's all the same issue. But you know, using this information again, if it was server side, right, you can see what server they were connected to. If you have multiple gateways, you can see what gateway they were coming from. You know, what client IP address they were coming from, and then of course, based on that IP address, right, what you know, what country are they coming from? And so on, you know, the case of a WAN user, maybe they were coming in, right, from somewhere in the Asia Pacific region to the US, right, going either over satellite or some other connection, you know, it, there's just, a, you know, bad latency when that happens. But at least now you can gather that information, you know, like in this case and say, hey, look, we know our data center infrastructure is okay. You know, something's going on on the user side, and then, you know, we can, you know, work with them to try to figure out what that is. So very powerful. We're just touching on the surface of the information. There's a lot more in here, too, in terms of the channels, the agents they've been connecting on, 
whether they're TCP or UDP, basically anything that has to do with that can the ICA connection, we're tracking that and can report on it. So the next thing I wanna to jump to is just show you what the advisories look like, and then, uh, then we'll probably open it up to uh, Q and A. So you see here at advisories, we've got both the upgrade and security advisory. I'm gonna go ahead and you know start with the upgrade advisory. You can see a very simple screen, tells you how many appliances, you have here you know, the first tab will show your MPX and SD, uh, VP, MPX and VPX. And then if you have any SDXs, you can see that on this instance, the reason the SDXs are separate, right, is because they have their SVM firmware that's separate from the technically the, the appliance firmware. So you can manage both of those separately. And you can see, you know, we show you all the builds that we are coloring. Uh, look questioning or looking for, we even go back in here to 11.1 and 12.0, even though they've reached end of life a while ago, but just to, again, report on those. If somebody's running older bills than that, then that's bigger problems uh, to worry about. But like I said here, you know, this is a great use case right now with 12.1 coming end of life, you know, at the end of May, in case we're good here, right? We have no instances running on 12.1. But if you had this in your environment and you had instances here on 12.1, well, you would want to, you know, really work on upgrading them before, you know, that time frame. And then you can see here our builds. We've got 10 instances on 13.1, one instance on 13.0. You can see what builds we're on. You know, so here we got one on the latest, and then all the rest are on older builds, right? So I can scroll down the list and see you know, which builds I'm on. And the same thing here on the 13.0, we're on one build behind. So say I, I want to now upgrade this instance. I either can click it here, click it there, you know, select instance to upgrade. It'll pull up all any of the instances in that list. So I can then, you know, confirm that that's what I want to upgrade. And then go to the upgrade workflow. It'll show you all those little, instances you give it a a name i'm just going to click this to show you but you we we provide it it's part of the service right we have all the firmwares available so you don't have to worry about going up to the download site and downloading the firmware again we take care of all of that for you so you can pick do i want to go to the latest 13.0 do i want to go to 13.1 you pick the build you want to go to, so say I want to go to the latest 13.0. Hey, Rich, okay. real quick, go back to that, go back yep. to the picker screen that you were just at. Yeah. What's my little badge there? So on 33.52, I got a little, little yellow badge. What special does that mean? Yeah, special, well, well, you can see it most downloaded. So <laughs> that's we tell you which ones people have downloaded the most. So that means, you know, pretty, uh, you know, pretty active uh, build. I think and I think on that screen first where you list all the instances, like what version they were at, there's also that badge. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's, and they'll, they'll tell but you if also if there's special builds and you that's also can set your yeah, special build. Yeah. Yeah. And you would also set your preferred build on that screen mm -hmm. as well. And then I'm not going to click through the rest here, but just one of the nice things too, when it comes to upgrades, this will do a pre check of the environment, right? Do you have enough disk? One of the biggest problems with upgrades is making sure you have enough disk space on the appliance. So this won't even let you start the process unless you have sufficient disk space uh, to do it. You can also then have your own scripts if you need something run after the upgrade is done. And then more importantly, right, as we mentioned, you can schedule when you want this to happen. So here's like a question, said, Rich. It, this yep, is kind yep. of along the lines of pre-upgrade validation. So I know it's pretty common over time for certain commands to get deprecated and you know newer commands to take over. Mm -hmm. um, is there any sort of pre-upgrade validation around, listen, you're on a version now and you're going to a newer version, but that call, that command that's in your old config has been deprecated. 
going forward? Like, is that addressed at all as a part of the upgrade? It's it's partially the, the issue with 13.1, a whole lot of things were deprecated. I'm sure mm -hmm. most of the people on the phone or in the seminar here hopefully know that. Um, so there are separate tools specifically to deal with 13.1. But yes, you know, if there's some minor pieces you know, that can be checked as part of that validation. It would be in the case of 13.1, it's a little more extreme. And, mm -hmm. you know, that requires some pre-work to be done manually just because it's okay. it's so extensive. It's extensive from 13.0 to 13.1. Got it. Okay. But yeah, for basic things. And uh, yeah, that, that's a great point. All right. So... That gives you an idea of the upgrade advisor. Again, very simple, but you know, is that very powerful? Now, if we switch over to the security advisory, like I said, it you know, runs on a weekly basis by default. You can run a manual scan at any point, tells you when it ran, but you know, more importantly, right, what CVEs are currently impacting your environment. So in this case, we it's only one CVE, it's affecting four instances, and we'll show you the CVE, right? We'll tell you the severity. So in this case, this one was low. It'll, tell, it'll give you the information about it, and then the, you know, show you what the remediation is, right? So this one has both a mm -hmm. firmware upgrade and commands to run. So we could go ahead and, whoop, sorry. Oh, is that not, so we can. Go here, view affected instances, right? So now you can see which instances are affected by that CVE. And then now, since this one has two fixes required, right? You can select all of these, do an upgrade workflow, which would be just what we went through before, but you also can now do a configuration job workflow, right? And I just want to click on this so you can see, but what this will auto, you know, these are the commands that were, we were, you know, told our customers to run to address, you know, mm -hmm. the CVE, you know, so we build that template for you. So this way, again, you don't have to worry about cutting and pasting or manually making an error when you push this out, but just like the firmware, right? You see the commands, you can tell it what instances, in this case, you can see here that you have variables, you'll specify the value for that variable, and then you can go ahead and uh, you know run that job. So yeah, and especially, yeah, whether you have one pair of net scalers or a fleet of them, you know, these pieces all can have uh, you know some use in you know simplifying the management you know of the environment. So I say hey, we already we got about uh, a little less than ten minutes left. Uh, if there was any more questions? So, and just to reiterate, just to point out, so ADM service is a feature of just spinning it up and importing my ADCs. I get everything under the infrastructure node, correct? So if we correct. pop over to the left here, and just by importing the machines. Um, now, from a deployment perspective, we we haven't really talked about this. So I've got these net scalers sitting in various locations. I've got the service. How do I get my net scalers connected to the service, so to speak? Yeah, good question. So we have something called an agent. So you do have to deploy an agent, you know, similar to like the cloud connectors on the virtualization side. We just call it an ADM service agent. And it acts as a broker between your appliances and the service. So this way... You don't have to expose your appliances directly to the cloud service. There's no ports to open. Our agent does, does a 443 connection outbound to the cloud and that, that facilitates all the communication. And then you just point your appliances when you onboard them to the service, you just tell it what agent to use. And you could have one or more one or more agents in your environment based on yeah. you know, for redundancy or geography or both. That makes sense. Yeah. But you'd want one in each location. Let's just say I've got data center out West, data center East spot in the cloud. So I'm hybrid multi-cloud. I'd want to have an agent wherever I've got ADCs sitting or can I do that um, from a single location where I've got. Yeah, it, it, it depends on the features that you're going to be using. Okay. If you're doing heavy analytics, usually you want the agents closer to the appliances because the data 
for the analytics piece is, you know, is significant. So it depends on your WAN as well. You know, we have some customers that would do that over a WAN if the latency is low enough. But typically for analytics, you want the agents near the devices. For the other pieces, it's not as important. You could have one device service multiple geographies, again, as long as the WAN is sufficient. And I just want to note, we're talking about the external agent here, not the built-in agent, because there is a built-in agent on the Netscaler. Yeah, that's um, yeah. We do we do confuse things a little bit. Yes, this is the yeah. external agent. Uh, yeah. There is a built-in agent that can run on the Netscalers themselves, but that is limited functionality for ADM. So it's kind of like a pool licensing. I think, right? Yeah, no, not even the pool licensing. The pool no, licensing requires the external agent. So it, it gives you some of the basic infrastructure pieces, and that's about it. So it's uh we kind of it's like a kind of like a tease to get you started with ADM. You know, like it could the advisories and that information it can get from that. So I can but get any it with the with the free tier of ADM with the service specifically, I can do the upgrade advisory, I can do security advisory, and I can also do less SSL management. So three of the yep. big use cases out of the gate. Yeah. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I forgot so if I own a Netscaler, I should be if I own a Netscaler. Even if I don't have pooled licensing, again, if you've got pooled licensing, you're using ADM to manage your licenses. But if I own a Netscaler, I should be using this, shouldn't I? Absolutely. And if and if you haven't, and if you've been, and if you did try ADM or MAS or NMAS, yeah. the different names it's had over the years, you know, it's changed a lot, especially in the last two years. So if you looked at it at one point. Uh, and you haven't looked at it recently, I would highly recommend looking at the ADM service, you know, revisiting it. it. You know, like I said, we just touched on a few of the pieces today, but it's worth worth a little bit of your time to see the improvements we've made and the the updates uh, that we've done. You know, I, I said, anybody that's moved to our ADM service has been very happy, you know, with the results. Cool. Awesome. Well, listen, we have three minutes left and I see Raj's face and Raj said he wasn't going to say anything unless we saw his face. So I'm going to hand it to Raj. Well, and, and, and thank you, Jeremy, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, disrupt the flow, but we are coming to uh, the, uh, the top of the hour. And uh, I want to thank everyone for the presentation and uh, Rich, thank you. And uh, Justin, thanks for, for working through that. And Jeremy, thanks for uh, guiding the discussion. I think one of the things is, you know, hopefully what you've taken from this is there's, there really is some, some really interesting functionality here, not terribly expensive, adds some real value. And, and what I want to suggest perhaps in terms of a call to action is that if you are interested, um, really doesn't take very much for us to, uh, to set up uh, a discussion or a, a more focused presentation associated with ADM. And uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. We're, we'd be glad to kind of tailor it for your environment. And um, what I want to point out is uh, uh, overwhelmingly you folks have, uh, or everyone will have a Zintegra rep that they can count, contact. Please just let them know that you'd like more information about uh uh, about ADM, and uh, they will uh, more than likely pull Justin and or one of our other panelists in here to help to talk to you about it. And 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 really, in the end, if we can help you manage your net scalers uh, more easily and not do it with a lot of expense, I think that's tremendous value. And so, uh, with that, I just really want to thank the uh, uh, Citrix team for their assistance. This has been wonderful to put this together. We look forward to doing many more. And uh, we, uh, I think what we want to point out is uh, Citrix continues to move down the path that it established many years ago. And uh, we're certainly all excited about uh, where they're going in the next uh, few months and years. So uh, Jeremy, thank you so much, Rich, you as well, uh, and Justin, and then also to, uh, to the folks who attended. Thank you so much for attending. We absolutely love when you attend our events and uh, we will be holding more of these. And with that, um, Unless there's any really, oh, wait a minute, there are a few questions or chats and all that, just some comments. That's so awesome. Um, uh, if there are more comments that come in, we'll get back to them or we will get back to you on them. But uh, in the meantime, I just want to sign off and say thank you very much. It's been just a pleasure uh, talking to you about, uh, about ADM and what it can do for you. Excellent. Thanks, Raj. Cheers.
Thanks, guys. Take care. Everyone, have a good day.